Hey, uh, good morning to everyone and welcome. Uh, it was nice to have a little pre-gathering uh, fun chatter. I uh, want to thank you for joining us for our executive briefing series. This one marks our one year anniversary. These were launched um, a year ago. Uh, over the past year, uh, the first two were in person, actually with eggs and all of the, the yummy foods. Uh, this, our uh, spring one and this one have been virtual, uh, but we've had over uh, 90 business and industry, civic and community, and higher education leaders, leaders join us. Uh, about a fourth of those, it was their first connection with Penn State Brandywine, maybe their first time on our campus or the first time to interact with us, which is just terrific because one of our goals is to expand our strategic partnerships. Others have been uh, longtime uh, partners and colleagues and donors and, and friends to our programs. Uh, looking back over the year, we've also had uh, a number of individuals who have attended every single one, uh, and which is which is terrific to see the commitment in Brandywine um, and our, our team, our student, and particularly our students. Um, so we will be reaching out to our external partners uh, to connect with you to see how you would like to continue to engage with Penn State Brandywine. You've demonstrated your interest and uh, commitment with us. So we'd like to get together with you and see what your interests are and what might we be able to create or build or do together that neither of us could do alone. Uh, we're all assets to our community and it's about connecting our assets and um, again that one community impacting many. Um, we know the series, uh, one of the attractive features of this series for, for many of our participants has been to connect with each other. Maybe you didn't care about us, but you wanted to connect with each other. Uh, in June, our first virtual one, we didn't uh, do virtual breakout rooms, but we are going to do that this time because we realize in this world of Zoom that opportunity to connect is just so um, valuable. Before we uh, jump into breakout rooms, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Marlene Livingstone and our development team who have uh, introduced and championed this and carried it forward even through a pandemic. We have uh, Jonathan Savage and Mike Gamble who are president and vice president of our Penn State Brandywine Advisory Board and several other board members. We have members of our leadership team and we have some folks who are joining us for the first time. Uh, one of which is a longstanding colleague of mine, goes back to the last century, uh, Brian Crow, who is a, a professor of sport management and chair of the Department uh, of Sport Management at Slippery Rock University. He is also owner of Game Day Consulting and a former president of the North American Society of Sport Management. So maybe you'll get lucky enough to get into a breakout room uh, with, with Brian. Um, so, um, with that, um, in just a moment, we will, um, Monica and Marlene and her team will hit the magic button, put us in the breaking, breakout rooms. But I also realize that for those of you who are joining us for the first time, I didn't introduce myself. Uh, I am Marilyn Wells, the Chancellor of Penn State Brandywine and delighted to be here this morning. So uh, Marlene or Jonathan, did you wish to add a word before we um, began to network? Oh, uh I'll let Marley go first. Why don't you go, Marley? No, I don't have anything. You guys can handle it. Go right ahead. Well, basically, just wanted to thank everybody for taking the time. It's, uh, as was spoken a couple times already this morning, it's a great day to be inside, but we're, we're glad to be in your company, as always, whether it's a Zoom call or in person, hopefully sometime in the near future. Really appreciate everybody taking the time and to be part of this particular occasion, as well as to spend some more time in the breakout rooms. I think that's a great idea. And I'm looking forward to our discussions today. So thanks again for the opportunity. Yeah. I also neglected to mention that uh, when we're all together as a group this morning, we are recording the session. Uh, they will not be recorded in breakout rooms. It's important that we always uh, share that. Um, at nine o'clock, we'll be introducing our speaker who I'm terrifically excited to have with us this morning. I know he will uh, delight us in great ways. So, uh, Take it away, Marlene. Okay, thanks everyone for joining. Um, our speaker's not on yet. He will be joining us uh, in time for his presentation. But we are gonna do some networking. I know Marilyn already mentioned this, but people sort of requested it after the last virtual one. People missed the opportunity. 
Um, and so this is my first time uh, attempting to organize breakout rooms. And in fact, monitoring from my staff is the one who's been um, working behind the scenes to make that happen. So she's going to hit the magic button and we're going to hope, there's Monica, we're going to hope that it works the way it's supposed to because we haven't done this before. Um, so uh, we're going to all break out into breakout rooms. We're going to do two sets of breakout rooms um, to hopefully you get to chat with some folks you haven't met before. I just want to say thank you for everyone for participating in that. I know that people um, in missed that from the last one. Um, so we tried to incorporate it. Hopefully you got to talk to some people you don't normally speak with. So um, thanks again. And Marilyn's gonna introduce our speaker. Right, and I think it's terrific. We also had some uh, students participating today and their interest in networking and meeting with you and vice versa. So without further ado, our executive uh, speaker today is Rob Marrow. Uh, after a 33 year career with Sunoco LP, where he held senior leadership roles in operations, sales, and marketing. Rob recently accepted an opportunity to oversee the international uh, growth strategy for advanced lubrication specialties, a leading independent manufacturer and supplier of lubricants and specialty fluids designed for automotive, industrial, and commercial applications. Uh, during his leadership of the performance products division, Sunoco LP became the world's largest manufacturer and supplier of fuels specifically designed for the high performance applications found in motorsports. So if you've ever been to the Pocono 500, you got it. Um, in addition to his career at Advanced Lubrication Specialties and previously Sunoco, Rob serves as an adjunct instructor at Penn State Brandywine and East Stroudsburg University. Rob and I are both alums of ESU and met through uh, another colleague of ours. Uh, Rob also is passionate about food and enjoys good Italian food, as do I, and has two uh, grown or young adult children who are starting their careers in this pandemic. Um, his courses uh, focus on international business, management, and marketing. Uh, as I mentioned, Rob received his BA from East Stroudsburg University, an MS from St. Joseph's University, and an MBA from Eastern University. Rob is also a native Philadelphian by birth and upbringing. Uh, so we're just so thrilled to have Rob join us this afternoon uh, or this morning. Uh, we know that energy along with, as Chris was telling us, project supply chain management uh, has definitely been a hot topic um, in, in these times. So uh, Rob, uh, take it away. We can't hear, we can't wait to see your presentation. Hey, Rob, you might have to unmute yourself there. Rob, you're muted. Okay, sorry about that. We okay now? Yep, well and clear. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get used to Meet and Teams and WebEx and Zoom, so I'm, I'm slowly catching on. Uh, as I uh, was saying while I was muted, I want to uh, express my appreciation to Chancellor Wells and to uh, Marlene Livingstone for uh, honoring me to uh, speak to you today. Uh, it's a topic that I'm passionate about, not just sports, uh, which I've been involved uh, my whole life and to this day I continue to participate as an adult, uh, but the business aspect uh, of sport, but business in general. And when Chancellor Wells gave me a basic, you know, clean sheet of paper and said, Rob, what would you like to present about? So, you know, I threw some international business issues out, some Office of Financial Asset Control, some of the things that businesses need to be concerned about if they cross over the border uh, to uh, market their uh, products. Uh, but we came back to the sport world and more specifically the environmental forces that impact uh, sports and uh, marketing sponsorships. So once we had that nailed down, I wanted to be able to use almost like a case study of some of my involvement when I was with Sunoco LP. Now, let me 
uh, state before I start that any of the opinions or assertions that I make are solely those of, of my uh, observations. Uh, nothing that I'm going to present uh, comes directly from Sunoco. Uh, although I've had a terrific 33 year career with Sunoco and I uh, don't have one day where I feel uh, that I wasn't pleased with my career, it was time to try something different. Uh, so that's where I'm at now. So none of the opinions or assertions are from either from so Sunoco corporate or from any of their employees. So I'm um, Marlene, I'm not sure if you're gonna be driving the PowerPoint and as Marlene drives it, uh, I will be asking her to advance to the next slide. So bear with us. Okay, Mar uh, okay, Marlene, do you want me to? Hold on one second, I'm just trying to make it full screen. Okay. Okay. Which is not gonna work for me. So we're just gonna do it this way. Uh, Marlene, after you share the PowerPoint, you can go to full screen and then it's gonna be popping up at the full screen. Okay. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> I'm gonna do my best here. I've done this once before. Now try to make it full screen. Go uh, to view or, 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 or the right at the bottom, whatever it is. No, it's not an option. It's not an option. Oh, okay. We, uh, Marlene, we can we can go from there. That's, yeah, it's fine. That is fine. You can yep. press F five. So, okay. what I, I want to emphasize before I start is that when we talk about environmental forces that impact sport marketing sponsorships, that's ne not a negative connotation all the time. There's at times that the various uh, forces actually will uh, work for the benefit uh, of a company that's uh, marketing in the sport world or marketing in business in general. Uh, but the five forces that are most often recognized in research or any textbook, uh, any publication in general, uh, you, you'll see that I put on the cover slide Sometimes economic is also referenced as financial, depending on the publication or the author. Competitive is usually con uh, fairly consistent. Regulatory, uh, that, that could also be referenced as legal. It could be referenced as political, uh, but more often than not, you'll, you'll see regulatory. And then social, that also sometimes is referenced as cultural or sociocultural. Uh, and then finally, technological, that's just like competitive, that's fairly consistent. Uh, you may see two others that you'll come across, and one is climate, depending on one, where one wants to market. There are certain concerns uh, or constraints that they need to be aware of. Uh, and then the other one is the consumer. Uh, things that you need to know by consumer. So environmental forces is basically what the uh, business has cannot directly control. So think of it that way and, and you'll understand uh, the rest of the presentation. Um, so if we go to the next slide, I wanted to give everyone a understanding of the magnitude of marketing sponsorships in general, not just sport, but I did break out sports share of the spend. You'll see in the, um, the bar graph to the, on the left, the global marketing sponsorship spend that in a relatively short period of time, it's gone from with an impressive 44 billion with a B dollars uh, to where it was in the most recent studies that have been conducted to almost $68 billion. United States, uh, North America, pardon me, alone 
is a, has, has showing about a 47, close to 50% increase. And that's fairly consistent through the other regions of the world with uh, Asia Pacific uh, actually showing some significant gains. But I wanted to, as I mentioned, I wanted to break it out and show you the other forms of sponsorships that are out there, marketing sponsorships, but the magnitude of what sport contributes to that. Uh, as you'll see, 70% of that $68 billion is actually coming from sport uh, globally. And then in North America, we are approaching 17 billion. I'm eventually going to reference this slide on my very last slide because there's one form that has been recently recognized as sport that is not on this slide or into the calculations of global spend uh, or marketing or sport marketing spend, but uh, is making a significant, a significant uh, impact uh, with marketers, with businesses trying to make a decision, especially if they're international. Uh, so if you could uh, advance to the next, Marlene. So here's the case study. Uh, I thought the best express what I encountered and the challenges that I encountered with um, the NASCAR sponsorship. Uh, as many of you may be aware, for the previous 50 years prior to 2004, their sponsor was either Pure, which became this, eventually the 76 brand. Uh, so in 2003, 76 made the decision based on some environmental forces, uh, mostly competitive, but some internal concerns where they started to bring on other brands. So they needed to not only sponsor 76 with their money, they needed to spread that out amongst the Arcos and others of, of the world that, that were under their purview. Uh, so that opened a door for us. So although everyone here is situated mostly around the Philadelphia area or Pennsylvania, New York, basically the Northeast, you're, you may think that Sunoco was a major, major petroleum marketer. Uh, well, in actuality, when we started to negotiate the NASCAR contract, we were going up against Exxon, Shell, and Citgo. So little old Sunoco, where they could put many more zeros at the end of their check than we could for NASCAR. NASCAR finally made their decision on who they felt they most comfortable with, with the quality of the product going forward for their sport. Uh, Sunoco going back to Roger Penske in the mid sixties with Mark Donahue, who was the driver for uh, Roger. Uh, we, we at Sunoco had always said, and we told NASCAR this, that motorsports and especially motorsport fuel is in Sunoco's DNA. Uh, so eventually we won the contract and we started, got the green flag in 2004. When we started, the product that was being used was 112 octane leaded product. So keep that in mind. So as we progress through uh, this timeline, 2005, we, we had zero issues. We had zero competitive regulatory economic um, uh, technological, uh, social issues at all. We, we were you know, very, very pleased to the point where we made a commitment to NASCAR that we would uh, identify and design our roughly 4,000 directly supplied or owned and operated uh, service stations and C stores at the tune of about $10,000 per site. So you can see roughly on a rollout basis, we spent in excess of $40 million as a result of our affiliation with uh, NASCAR. But to emphasize the ability to negotiate or to um, amend a contract, we went back to NASCAR and said, look, we're giving you all this exposure we want something in return. So our initial contract was from 2004 to 2013. We said, we want another three years on, on our contract. 
And they gladly accepted because the value what we were giving them at over 4,000 sites with, as you can see on the canopy, canopy, the official fuel of NASCAR, they were glad to do it. Plus they were happy with our product. Continuing on 2006, we, we uh, I'm sorry, Marlene, <laughs> continuing on, we'll stay on this one for, for a little while. Uh, so in 2006, uh, we had another you know, very, very successful year. There was no environmental forces that, that dropped upon us. Then at the end of 2006, both Brian France, who was the then chief executive officer of NASCAR, and I received letters from senators throughout the United States uh, indicating, uh, as some of you, if you're familiar with uh, geography and flags, uh, that's a flag of Kazakhstan. Their quotes inside their letters to Brian, France, and myself was, if Kazakhstan can get the lead out of their fuel, why can't NASCAR? So NASCAR um, requested or actually directed me to develop a fuel that did not have lead that could be used in high performance engines. So that's the regulatory side where, or the political side where we got pressure and you know it was the right thing to do. Uh, so I went to the, uh, the engineers that worked for me, one chemical engineer and one mechanical engineer, by the way, both Penn State grads, uh, I wanted to make sure I mentioned that. Um, and I said, look, we need to come up with a high performance fuel that'll work under the stress of a NASCAR uh, season, uh, but it cannot have lead in it. So in 2007, we introduced what we called the 260 GTX. It was only, it, we went from 112 leaded down to a 98 octane uh, unleaded, but non-oxygenate. So it had no oxygenate inside the fuel. Uh, and they were pleased with that. We got uh, high marks from both regulatory and politicians and also uh, from the NASCAR population. Also in 2007, we were faced with a competitive force and that came from Shell. Shell went to NASCAR with a enormous check and said, we wanna enter a car in NASCAR's top series. Uh, at the time, it was the Nextel Cup Series. And NASCAR said, well, we're going to have to approach Sunoco uh, because they have the official fuel uh, sponsorship with us. It's a spec fuel. All NASCAR has to use Sunoco fuel even to this day. And we went back and forth and begrudgingly, we said, okay, but it can't be their gasoline brand cannot have prominence on the car. It has to be their lubricant uh, uh, logo. So what we came up with was that the gasoline logo could only be one third the size of the lubricant logo. And NASCAR was happy that we made that concession, that competitive concession. But we said, wait a minute, NASCAR, we made this concession where you could get a big check from Shell. Let's go back to trying to negotiate additional years on our contract. So we got our second time, we got plus three years to our contract. So we were slowly elongating our uh, time in NASCAR, which we were pleased with. We were showing uh, great returns. We had especially down in the Southeast, we had jobbers or large distributors that indicated that the reason they wanna to come to switch their brand from brand X to Sunoco is because they wanna be affiliated with the official fuel of NASCAR. So it, it worked out for us uh, by elongating and extending contracts. Then the bottom fell out uh, with the financial crisis, uh, the end of, 2007, 2007 was not the best year for us, but we made the best of it. Then came the financial crisis, uh, 2008, 2009, 2010. Um, most of the impact was on NASCAR, the sanctioning body, the property, the association. 
and they saw a significant de decline in their at track fan base attendance. As you can see, it was off roughly 48%. Uh, we, even though there was less fuel used uh, in general throughout NASCAR, when it came to the top three series, which at the time was still, uh, well, at this time they switched over to Sprint, Nextel replaced Sprint. Uh, and then it, they had the uh, Nationwide Series, which is now the Xfinity and the, and the uh, Camping World tr uh, Truck Series, which is now the Gander Truck Series. As you can hit, see, their sponsors have kind of done the dance over the years. Uh, but the fuel that we provide for those top three series for the day of the, the days of the events, testing and qualifying uh, was gratis. So we gave the fuel to them for free. If they bought, if they needed the fuel back at their shop for dyno testing, for off track testing, then they purchased it from us. So we saw a small decrease in our, in our sales. So we got over the hump of the 08, 09, and 10 uh, crises. Uh, NASCAR is still to this day struggling with bringing back their attendance. But at the end of 2010, the, we, Brian France uh, and I received another letter from senators. Uh, this time it was from the senators in the Midwest, the corn growing states saying, we're happy that you got the lead out of the fuel back in 2007, uh, but, but we would now like to see you put an oxygen in the fuel. And specifically, we want ethanol to be put into the fuel. So once again, NASCAR and I put our heads together uh, we worked with their uh, R&D uh, research and development team. We, uh, we worked with the R&D for each and every one of the top teams in NASCAR to come up with a fuel. Uh, so the fuel stayed at 98 octane, but now it had a 15% ethanol blend in it. So, which is they use to this day and it's called the Sunoco Green E15. So, because of our concessions, the, the increased amount of capital that we had to uh, expend, we had to change how we service the events at the track because ethanol, for those of you that aren't aware, can have the propensity to uh, draw water. And the last thing we wanted to have that happen in underground storage tanks at the track was for have a problem with someone losing the race and pointing the finger at NASCAR. So we retrofitted tanker trucks and all races, no matter where they were at in the United States, were being serviced by tanker trucks versus pulling the fuel out of the ground. So that was a substantial ex capital expense for us. So we went back to NASCAR once again and said, look, we, we've done all this. We want another three years to our contract. And NASCAR agreed. Uh, not once did we get a pushback from NASCAR. But 2011 didn't just stop with what we had changed the fuel at the request of senators from the Midwest corn growing states. We also started to get pressure from NASCAR to allow the trade industry uh, of ethanol, American ethanol, growth energy, uh, we, to allow them to be a contingency sponsor or a sponsor uh, for NASCAR. And we pushed heavily against that, but we finally said, you know what? We want another three years uh, to our contract. So now it, this is the last time we went to them for additional years. They, they gave it to us. And the, if you look at a NASCAR car closely around the gasoline port where the nozzle goes in or the fill, can filler goes in, you'll see American ethanol around there. We permitted that. Uh, that gave us another three years, which the 2004 contract, which only went to 2013, now goes to 2025. So we were off and running 2012 and uh, 2013. We've had a lot of success. Then we started to be challenged with two things. One with how do we appeal and engage consumers 
that are fans of NASCAR or fans or consumers in general. So we started to look at the demographics and specifically the advanced aging of the fan base throughout sport. So that's the two, uh, the one slide and, and the one uh, graph that you see there, uh, an Excel uh, spreadsheet showing the, and it gets larger. I put larger ones at the end of this, so don't strain your eyes. But we took a look and we saw that uh, NASCAR was significantly aging over time. Uh, and in part of my presentation, you'll see some of the target marketing and some of the segmentation that we did to try to appeal to a, a larger fan base. So let's go to 2017 and you'll see in this, you'll notice the NASCAR two different logos. So the top logo there matches the logo that you see under 2004 when we first took over NASCAR. It, mat it matches the logo that you see on the canopy uh, back right ahead of 2005. Remember I indicated we spent close to four, over $40 million. NASCAR decided that they needed to start having a different branding image. They needed to change their logo, which was the first change in a long time. Well, that's fine for NASCAR, but what did that mean to Sunoco? That meant that we had to make a decision. Do we go out and do we retrofit the canopies and all the graphics on dispensers and fascia of the facilities? Uh, we elected not to, uh, and we had indicated that we will, as we replace some of our canopies, our signage, we will transfer to the new NASCAR logo. But this was, the, I put this there just to show you the financial impact of decisions that you may not have foreseen when you first entered into a sponsorship, a marketing sponsorship, but are ones that could rear their ugly heads down the road. So 2018 and 2019 and the beginning of 2020, looks like we got the green flag, no issues. Well, 2018 and 19, yes, we had no issues in, in NASCAR. But my next slide, which don't advance to it yet, will show that 2018 and 2019 was not an easy time for either Sunoco or me specifically. Um, but let's jump to 2020 and you'll see the beginning of 2020, NASCAR started to see some of their Daytona 500, which in February, they started to see some of their fan base coming back versus previous years. So the, the TV ratings were slightly up uh, and, or at least trending in the right direction. And then the pandemic hit. So NASCAR did not race at all. They got the red flag, everything had to stop, which is obvious and is understandable. Uh, so they stopped for approximately two months uh, and then, then they opened back up, but you'll see on the uh, track photo there, they opened up with no fans uh, in the stands. So number one is we were losing out on some of the economic financial advantage of having a uh, fan base uh, see our logo, uh, whether it be on the pit in, pit out, whether it be on the dump cans, uh, whether it be around the track. So some of the value that we placed on it, when we decided on how much of a check that we were gonna sign, uh, we were starting to lose out on. So we went back to NASCAR and said, we're not going to push for force majeure, but what we are going to do is we were gonna request additional assets, not years on our contract, because we understand everyone was suffering, but we were gonna request additional assets, whether they be TV, radio. Uh, we pretty much got away from print. Print was back big back in 2004 uh, with our marketing um, activation commitment, but we started to push it more towards digital. So as you can see, there were competitive issues, there were regulatory and economic issues uh, that we faced. And these are just a small, small sampling of what we faced. At each and every track, we faced fire marshals uh, requiring us to have different equipment on site. And it made sense. You have 100,000 plus fans. You don't want to have an unsafe environment. So that's kind of the picture of NASCAR. If we can move to the next uh, slide, please, Marlene. 
as I said, in 2008 and 2019, 2018 and 2019, although it was a uh, successful time at NASCAR, uh, I was dealing with other issues, heavily on regulatory and economic. We became the official fuel of the NHRA, that's the drag racing, um, in 2015. And instead of having a green flag, they start their races with what they call the Christmas tree. It goes from yellow staging to green go and red if there's a false start, bad start. So we got our green light in 2015. Um, as you can see, and I, I put there the at track price of what the competitors pay, the competitors for nitromethane. Nitromethane is the fuel that's used in the two top series, both what it's called top fuel and funny car. They're the cars that go, it used to be a quarter mile. They shortened the track to a hundred feet or a thousand feet, pardon me, uh, when a unfortunate event of a driver being killed in 2008. So they'll go 330 miles an hour within a thousand feet. So they'll get down that track in about 3.5 seconds. Uh, and the product that they use is nitromethane which there's only one place in the world that produces, that is willing to produce motor sports grade nitromethane, which is either 99.97% pure or 99.9% pure nitromethane. Uh, and we used 99.9% pure. The only one place in the world was China, that you, the factories in China. Um, so the first few years, you know, at track, although it's expensive, almost $20 a gallon for a 42 gallon drum, uh, it was $795 that the team had to pay. So it was the pretty steady throughout the first three years of the contract. And then in 2008, the end of 17 and 18, there started to be an escalation. And I should mention nitromethane is one of the two main components that Timothy McVeigh used to blow up the Murrow building in Oklahoma City. So it is heavily, heavily regulated by Homeland Security. So we had to spend a large amount of capital and expense uh, to make sure our warehousing of the drums uh, was met the uh, requirements of Homeland Security. Uh, we had to make sure the transportation of those drums uh, were safe, the recovery of those drums with any amount of product in, there had to show a chain of custody uh, at all times. Well, in China, we had two things that impacted the price. The top design or uh, that I put on there is actually the, the logo for the Ministry of Environmental Protection in China they started to have requirements for factories uh, due to pollution in China. Uh, they start to have some heavy requirements and oversight, which shut down a lot of factories. So the old supply and demand started to kick in. So that was the first impact on the economics, the financial side, not only for us, but also for the competitors. And then below that, you'll see the, the two um, trailers, one of the United States, one China. This is right when the trade, eventually trade wars started. So when the tariffs were put on products, nitromethane was one of the many products that started off in that 10% tariff and then eventually has escalated to 25% uh, tariff, which it's still under. So you can see a competitor over a brief period of time has gone from about 19 to 20 dollars a gallon which yes is very expensive up to um, close to or right at 40 dollars a gallon put it in perspective the average top fuel or funny car when they drive that thousand feet down the track they use about 10 gallons of nitromethane in a thousand feet so the expense the the economic the financial impact that we all uh, had faced were significant. Um, so I wanted to give you that perspective of how regulatory things that, you know, we may not have fully understood at first because the Homeland Security had 
amend it and change some of the requirements. So that added financial expense to us, but then also the escalation of the product that we were in, that we, that we were importing from China uh, rose significantly. But Marlene, if you can go to the next page. So I mentioned earlier, we were concerned about the demographics of all of our consumers, uh, but primarily in my world, those that were in motorsports or with NASCAR. So we did research similar to this that was uh, conducted by the National Association of Con Convenience Stores, better known as the NAX Association, uh, and quickly understood that our frequent shoppers were in an age bracket uh, between 18 and 49. Um, and we, we looked at our technological abilities and we saw that we were still somewhat archaic in how we communicated with our uh, consumers. Uh, so we knew that we needed to step up our technological game uh, and try to target that prime 18 to 49 year olders uh, to who were coming into our facilities more often. Uh, we needed to come up with a a plan, a strategy to, to address them. We found out, as I mentioned in below there, you can read, you know, they drive more significantly. Uh, they're concerned about quality and at Sunoco, you know, quality is probably the marquee that we, we marketed on along with the credit card program, uh, but they can be encouraged to change. So to prevent someone from leaving Sunoco to go to Exxon, Shell, Citgo, whomever, we realized that we needed to get more digital. We needed to come up with you know, apps that can be used, applications that can be used at the pump to appeal to this group and tie it into different types of marketing programs and reward programs with primarily supermarkets throughout our marketing footprint. So we took that initiative. Uh, so I wanted to point out the age group for a purpose of my next slide. So here is the demographics age specific of the various sports. And this was conducted by the Sports Business Journal, but it's also supported by many of those that do research in sport. Uh, and you'll see, and I highlight it NASCAR. There was no real figures for NASCAR in 2000, and primarily because they really didn't share the information. But in 2006, you'll see that the average age was 49. So that was at the very top of that segment, that, that demographic, age demographic that we felt was our target consumer. But now in 2016, you'll see that they've advanced plus nine years. So the average NASCAR fan who considers themselves a fan of the sport has, has grown by nine years. Really, there's only one sport on there that I wanted to point out. And there's only, the only ones that were showing a higher age bracket you'll see is primarily golf horse racing and the Association of Tennis Professionals, which is men's professional tennis. But you'll see that um, women's tennis, the WTA, the, the Women's Tennis Association has actually decreased in its age bracket. So for those that are looking to market, uh, maybe they're, they're not getting the total TV time by the networks or by Fox or by whomever, but you know, that may be a spot where in the future and making sure that the, the amount of uh, support is consistent with the amount of coverage that received, but that the WTA is one that, you know, to keep an eye out on. And the other one that is basically unchanged is MLS. So that's the professional soccer. Um, so I wanted to put in the slide about the, uh, the age brackets and the social um, demographics, the, the age that we're targeting for this specific purposes. So my last responsibility with NASCAR was to start working with them on identifying how us as one of the, there's 57 sponsors in NASCAR, just so you know that sponsor NASCAR in one capacity or other. A anywhere from the official pain cream, Blue Emu, all the way up to Goodyear and Sunoco. Goodyear and Sunoco are the only two sponsors where NASCAR has to use 
our pro the, our products. The other 55 sponsors are pretty much, you know, just a contingency or a primary or a secondary sponsor, but their product does not is not mandatory usage in the sport. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, once again, we took a look at technology and we said, where do we, where do we converge or merge our uh, technology that we were developing and recommending to NASCAR? And how do we identify which sites or platforms to direct them to or to have a more enhanced relationship with? And I put that on there just so you can show that this slide pretty much supports the age target uh, demographics that I mentioned earlier, uh, when you look at social and technological forces. So there's one other, and I mentioned earlier in the presentation that there was one form of sport that is emerging that has to be um, reckoned with. And marketers, especially international marketers uh, who want to be involved in sports sponsorship need to recognize and potentially address. So if we can move to the next slide. And you can see where I highlight it and, and put in my own uh, age, average age in 2016. Actually, it's 2018 when this study was done. But esports, that's the gamers that are out there. There are stadiums being built for exclusive use for gaming. And look at the average age of the gamer. And although this uh, research came from PMG, which is very, very uh, prominent in, in sport uh, research uh, studies, uh, that, that 26 year age has to be an eye opener for marketers. Uh, so I wanted to throw that in there, which leads me into my next and final slide. I wanted to give you a perspective of esport audience growth over the years, the revenue streams that come out of global gaming and, and, and esports, and the average uh, salaries uh, of esport gamers. You can see the significant, significant incline uh, in 2013, 2014. And the only reason you see the drop off uh, this year through July, and, ha and it has nothing really to do with the pandemic. It's that most of the major championships or events that happen in esports will happen at the end of the third quarter into the fourth quarter. So it's not going to reach the 234 million, but it's sure going to be darn close. Uh, so my final comment is, other than look what I highlighted in yellow. This is a marketer's dream, especially if you're dealing internationally. These, this audience is global. They're young, think lifetime value. They're digital and they're diverse. You know, the, the, the number of fans alone is over 600 million. Remember, we have what, 330 million uh, citizens in the United States? Uh, Asia makes up a large, large portion of that number. So I can assure you that if I ever step back into Asia, Asia Pacific, that this will be a, a front of mind awareness for me. So my final comment is for those parents, and I'm one of them, that told your children to get outside and, you know, throw the ball around uh, or uh, play basketball or take, you know, just take a jog uh, and stay away from the joystick and stay away from those video games. For some, it's worked out pretty darn well. The top 25 gamers average salary, $3.6 million. Put it in perspective, Tampa Bay Lightning, who won the NHL Stanley Cup this year, their average salary was $3.2 million. So, and you can go to the next slide, Ryan. I want to thank everyone for your time, for your attention. Uh, I put my phone number on there. I put my uh, email, personal email address. If I can in any way at all help you out uh, in understanding some aspects of it, 
you know, I would be more than happy to. I enjoy talking about it. I have some unique perspectives that uh, you know, that I love to share. So thank you. And I greatly, greatly appreciate uh, uh, the opportunity. Okay, I know we're um, uh, we have about 15 minutes till 10 o'clock, uh, but certainly uh, thank you, Rob, first off, for sharing that. Something that we don't know about on a daily basis, exposing us to new information. Uh, many universities and colleges are launching programs in eSports. Um, I believe one of our student organizations is around eSports uh, or Dungeons and Dragons, a particular eSport. But let me open it up for questions from our uh, participants this morning. Hey, hey, Rob, David Rosenberg, I'll start. Um, you, you kind of threw me a curve, frankly, with your with your presentation, because it was it's it's something that, you know, it's it's kind of like reverse of what I understood. Um, so you, you've obviously, Sunoco obviously spent an inordinate amount of, of capital on making the decision to um, have a sponsorship opportunity with 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 NASCAR. Frankly, you know, I was of the understanding that NASCAR would pay you <laughs> for, you know, for, for that. Um, what goes into the decision-making process with respect to that? Um, how do you, how did you determine the ROI? Um, and, uh, you know, your continuing relationship, uh, you, you know, when, when I look, for example, at a, at a Nike sponsorship, for college football for Penn State. Am I under the wrong assumption that Nike is paying Penn State for that um, endorsement? I mean, how, how does all that work and, and what went right. into your decision-making? Right, so the decision-making, well, let's first address the, the capital expense uh, around NASCAR. Uh, when I first came into the sport uh, of NASCAR, I was told uh, immediately that NASCAR, the, um, the acronym NASCAR is not National Association of Stock Car Auto Racing. It's actually a needs astronomical sums of cash applied regularly. <laughs> and that became 100% accurate. Uh, so we most, and they're known as associations and racing as sanctioning bodies. Um, they require a, for a relationship, uh, for a sponsorship that you pay them and you negotiate the, the rights um, to your property, to your company. Uh, so we, we, the ROI side of things, um, when we sat down in 2004, we basically had to take a look and make a an educated assumption of how many new distributors we would bring on. So a distributor in the, in the gas uh, uh, world and diesel world is anywhere from let's say 20 retail sites or they may have 400 retail sites. So we made some assumptions of how many of those we would bring on, what would be the average gallon, what would be our average margin, and then also we were spending marketing dollars in other forms that we felt that we could re, uh, redirect, that they, they became stale. Uh, and to be quite frank, our senior vice president at the time who eventually became our CEO, Bob Owens, was a big supporter of motorsports. He actually was a licensed uh, race car driver himself, uh, not in NASCAR, uh, but that, that's what he, uh, enjoy it. And I tell people all the time, you can look at the CEO of a company and almost determine what they enjoy doing. Now, I take Citgo, for example. Citgo, they were in racing for the longest time, and then they changed CEO who was into bass fishing. And next thing you know, they're the official uh, uh, sponsor, naming sponsor of the Bassmaster Classic. Then, then he left power uh, as a CEO, and then they got back into racing again. So th there's a lot of factors that go into the decision, but no, Penn State is actually paying for that um, 
right to put the Nike swoosh on their equipment, on their, you know, their uniforms, et cetera. And Nike will be paying it. Uh, Nike does give endorsement uh, fees. And I use, look at endorsements. I use LeBron James as an example. His salary is $32 million a year. What he makes in endorsements is about $53 million a year. So it's, it's almost, you know, a trade-off. Uh, and I'm not 100% aware of Nike's deal with Penn State and other college properties. But I, but I can tell you that um, they are not um, paying uh, the colleges to, for the right for them to put their logo on, on different equipment or, or apparel. Well, well, I appreciate that comment. And that's like totally the reverse of what I envisioned. Uh, you know, I figured if Nike's paying LeBron James, then they're paying Penn State or they're paying Clemson or they're paying somebody else. But what I heard you say is that we, we are paying Nike for the right to use that, the, the, the swish. In certain applications, and there, I'm sure that there's a reciprocal financial enumeration uh, which I'm not 100% familiar with uh, with Penn State and Nike, but I can assure you that you know Penn State is not uh, just solely on the receiving end uh, of the uh, of the check. Thank you. And, and can I can I make the assumption that that other brands work in the same way? I mean, if if we are using. Pepsi at our, you know, at, in Beaver Stadium, and that becomes our exclusive product. We're paying Pepsi for the right to use that product. Yeah, and pouring what is called pouring rights at, at venues. Uh, Pepsi would be paying primarily for the right because they're going to be able to monitor the revenue that's coming in at that at that uh, facility at that venue. Um, you know, venue sponsorships, um, naming rights, AT&T down in Dallas at the AT&T Stadium, they're paying about 19 million a year. Lincoln Financial in Philadelphia here with the Eagles uh, are paying somewhere around 12 million a year. Um, so they are paying uh, the, the actual venue to put, uh, put on uh, uh, the facility. So it's, it's sort of like a potpourri of different options. One thing I found out about contracts, uh, they can be negotiated in the beginning and they can be amended no matter what people say. Okay, you have a contract, you can't do anything else with it. If you have a asset to give in return, i.e. my plus three years that I negotiated with NASCAR, um, you know, properties are willing to uh, uh, cooperate and, and, and work collaboratively with you. Thanks, Rob. Mm -hmm. David, with things like Pepsi, um, as Rob was saying, there's usually a give and a take in there. Oftentimes, the pouring rights contracts, things will come along with it, whether it's um, X number of dollars of scholarships for students, or maybe they've purchased billboards and they'll give up some of their billboards for your institution. Um, so it's a, um, there's, there's winners and losers. I mean, there's uh, winners on both sides of that uh, and compromises. Mm -hmm. Other questions for Rob this morning? Yeah, Rob, thank you very much. This is Bill Henderson. I, I, one slide that really jumped out at me was the demographic trends and the, and pretty much every sport you saw the age you know, increasing for, for viewership or attendance and significantly in some of the big, uh, the big four, um, not so much the NFL, but you know, definitely Major League Baseball. And I, I think the, the pandemic and the lack of ability to attend this year is going to continue that trend are they are the major sport organizations talking about this and are they concerned about it like I think they should be yeah, absolutely and I can tell you my opinion to date the top four are doing a less than great job of identifying those and I'm going, to, I'm going to go younger than 18 years old. I'm going to start at 13 year olders uh, up to, and let's just go to the, the 13 to 34 demographic. Um, they're doing a poor job. And, and yeah, that's why you see a lot of 
of that demographic transcending and moving towards esport uh, or moving towards other forms of entertainment, uh, getting away from network TV, traditional TV, and going to streaming. Uh, esports, although it's you'll see it on ESPN uh, and some other networks, it's primarily through streaming. So they're pulling that demographic away from traditional forms of sport, traditional forms of uh, entertainment uh, viewing uh, avenues, network TV, et cetera, and they're pulling them into the streaming. So mm -hmm. I believe that in a pandemic, you know, this year is a really tough example, uh, but previous years, I don't think any sport jumps out to me that has done a really good job of identifying how they're going to pull in that group. They've, they've done a poor job of identifying how they're going to um, bring in a diverse uh, fan base. You know, NASCAR is trying their hardest. You know, they have Bubba Wallace in the top series, an African-American driver. Uh, Michael Jordan just joined in. He's gonna have a car next year. Uh, driven by Bubba Wallace. Uh, he joined in with Denny Hamlin, a NASCAR driver. So Michael Jordan just put a lot of money into the sport and NASCAR jumped all over that because her, hopefully that they can identify a diverse population. But with the sport world in general, I think they have a, a uphill battle in identifying and, and recruiting a diverse population and a younger demographic population. And not that I have the answer, uh, but you know that's a observation, not necessarily a critique. Rob, as you were saying at the beginning, you were kind of given a uh, disclosure about your commentary is that of yours and, and not of Sunoco's and so forth. I think anyone that watches so many of the YouTube content creators and YouTube channels and looking at what some of the younger uh, folks are making, you know, even in their college years. And uh, many of the young people are going, as you said, more toward the live streaming. Uh, when you look at what the vloggers and the YouTube content creators and the podcasters are making, um, those numbers sometimes get close to approximating the esports um, in both viewership and uh, what the what the players are making. So uh, maybe we have time for, well, we're, we're at 10 o'clock, but uh, I um, want to thank everyone so very much for participating today, uh, for the good questions that you asked for, you asked of Rob. Uh, certainly we can, uh, you can connect with him on LinkedIn. If you're really excited, he's teaching uh, a course or two for Penn State Brandywine next semester and um, is still very involved with advanced lubricant products. Um, any final words, uh, Rob or um, uh, Marlene? No, for me, once again, I, I sincerely want to thank uh, both Marlene and you for uh, identifying me as maybe being able to share some information that you may not normally be exposed to. Uh, hopefully, uh, everyone has um, benefited uh, from uh, mm -hmm. pieces of this presentation. Uh, this is normally when I teach sport marketing or marketing strategy, and I talk about environmental forces. This is normally something that uh, usually takes me four to six uh, classroom hours to go through thoroughly. So I try to condense it into 20 minutes. And we didn't have to take the test to write the paper either. <laughs> Could you uh, share a bit maybe how, how individuals could access the recording if they wish to do that? Uh, sure. I mean, we can always send out the recording. I'm not sure of any other way that we'll be able to make it available. Mm -hmm. um, we have to make sure that the closed captioning is included before we make it available. And so we'll be doing, um, and then we can send it out to people who participated today and, and our larger um, email list. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, again, thank you everyone uh, for participating. Uh, as, as David said, really kind of a different topic that maybe turned our thinking around, uh, and that's what these executive briefing series about, bringing people together, being exposed to new ideas and challenging us in new ways. 
Um, so thank you so much, everyone. Uh, have a great day, even though it's a very wet and rainy one. Take care of yourself and take care of each other and stay, stay safe and healthy. Thanks, Marilyn. Thanks, Rob. All we right, are. Take care. And stay brandy wine. <laughs>